regarding uh, the status of workers as contract, uh, contractors versus employees. Uh, this is a complex issue, particularly for arts and culture organizations who uh, very frequently hire what, as we know, uh, are called gig workers uh, and freelancers. Uh, and after the presentation, uh, George and Petra will be uh, moderating a uh, networking conversation, sort of a catch up. So you can all share news and talk with each other and um, uh, maybe exchange information um, since uh, during the pandemic, it's very it's been uh, very difficult to host our monthly uh, Thrive Arts and Culture Tag. So we're gonna take that last half hour from four to 4.30 uh, to give you op an opportunity uh, to reconnect. Uh, so let's begin our presentation now on AB5 and AB2257. Uh, and Georgia, Petra and I are uh, pleased to introduce our speaker on this subject. Uh, Shivani Sutaria, and she's the founder of Sutaria Law Offices in San Mateo. Uh, Shivani received a Master of Arts in Sociology from the University of Southern California and her Juris uh, Doctorate from the University of San Francisco Law School, my alma mater, woohoo! Uh, and Shivani practices law in San Mateo where she focuses on employment law and workplace investigations. She is a graduate and a certificate holder from the Association of Workplace, uh, in, I'm sorry, Association of Workplace Investigators Training Institute. Uh, and prior to starting her own for, firm in 2014, uh, Shivani worked at a San Francisco law firm litigating employment disputes in federal and state courts and administrative agencies. And while Shivani cannot answer questions that are specific to your uh, organization or its situation, uh, we are uh, 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 able to have you submit questions that are of a general nature about the, these laws in our chat. So you can enter them in the, the chat, which Petra, uh, who's an expert at, at Q&A on Zoom, will be monitoring. So welcome, Shivani. Uh, thank you for your presentation on this important topic, and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Robin, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I am so very excited to be here. Um, from a professional perspective, AB5 is something that I talk about and address for clients all the time. Um, on a personal note, uh, as I explained to Robin when we first talked, I'm essentially fangirling all of these organizations <laughs> that are here today. I recognize things like Art in Action, which I've been doing in my kids' schools for years. I have kids that are active in um, musical theater and community theater and saw some of those organizations that are here. And so I'm just really excited to be speaking to this particular um, audience and the, and the leaders within them. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share a lot of information today um, and I'm, it's quite dense and I'm hoping that it's not too heavy on the legal ease and that I'm gonna be able to explain what I'm trying to explain about the law in a way that is um, clear and understandable. But I will say that AB5 and the follow-up bill that was just passed, AB2257, like a lot of statutes are written in really weird ways where um, you can't always understand or it's not very clear what um, the legislature is trying to convey. The other thing is both of, I mean, AB2257 is brand new, AB5 um, only was implemented on August, uh, or sorry, January 1st, 2020. And so while there, we have seen some litigation around these issues, it's, it's a new law and it is developing. And much of it is going to be defined as litigation ensues um, and as 
these additional uh, uh, statutes are uh, signed into law. So I am going to be following, I, I created a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna be following the PowerPoint presentation um, and going through that and again, hoping that um, I'm presenting this in a, in a clear way. If you do have questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, hoping that we'll have time to go over any questions that you may have. All right, so I am going to screen share now. <clears throat> Can everyone see that? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, perfect. So in a, in a way to create a title that may be relevant to what we're talking about, Music to My Years, AB 2257's amendment to AB 5. And as we get into the details of AB 2257, we will see that it may be music to some folks ears and not to everyone's ears um, and you'll see why as we go through it okay so this is just my disclaimer that i put in front of every um, presentation i do this presentation is for informational purposes only this presentation does not constitute legal advice or establish an attorney client relationship All right, um, what did AB5 do? So what AB5 AB is a California statute that became law about a, a year ago um, to, to this day, back in 2019, became effective January 1st, 2020. And what it was doing was actually codifying a California Supreme Court case called Dynamex Operations West Incorporated versus Superior Court of Los Angeles. And it was that case that in which this California Supreme Court said, we are now going to be using a new test to determine if a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. What that court case also did was create a presumption that every worker performing services for remuneration is an employee. Now that is a rebuttable presumption because you can show, nope, based on this test, I am an independent contractor. But it's kind of a starting point um, in, in the law that if you're a worker, you're performing services for an entity, you are an employee. Okay, so the ABC test. That is the new test under AB5. What is the ABC test? So very, I'm going to go through each factor, but very generally, um, one thing to know about the ABC test is it's an and test, meaning the hire, the burden is on the hiring entity to prove all three of these factors, okay? Not or, and. You have to show that the person that you are hiring to perform services can satisfy all in all three of these factors. So the first factor is A, is the worker free from control and direction of the hire um, as to performing work, both under the independent contractor agreement as well as in fact. So that means in actuality in terms of what the relationship's like. So really the word to take away from that is control. A is about control. B, does the worker perform work outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business? B is where the issues have arisen. B is what has really had the impact of narrowing who can be an independent contractor. And I'm gonna go into more details about what B is about, as well as the other factors. And then C is, is, a worker, is the worker customarily engaged in an independently established trade or business of the same nature performed for the hiring entity? That's a lot of words to simply say, the person that you're hiring, do they have an independently established business, okay? 
So let's go through each one of these one by one. A, free of control. So again, when you're thinking about A as the hiring entity and you wanna bring someone on, the question to ask yourself is, does the entity, you, the hiring entity, exercise or even retain the right to exercise the, and control the manner and means in which the work is performed? So that can mean a lot of things. That can mean, are you going to tell that person how to do their job, when to do their job, where to do their job. But it means more than that. Are you going to require them to attend meetings? Are you going to ask them to turn in reports? Are you going to be supervising their work? The courts have also said that one primary area that demonstrates control is if the hiring entity has the ability to unilaterally separate the relationship. So in other words, can the hiring entity, entity say, you're fired? If the, only the hiring entity has the right to do that, then the courts have said, well, that's control. And so when we're analyzing free of control, we're looking at the words in the independent contractor agreement, as well as what does that relationship really look like? B, outside usual course of business. Now, as I mentioned, this is the one that is the most difficult to satisfy because what you need to ask yourself is, is that worker you're bringing on providing services that are integral to what that business does? So for example, if I am, um, if I am a newspaper, am I bringing on someone, am I bringing on a journalist? Is a journalist, integral to what a newspaper does? Yes. If I am a yoga studio and I am bringing on a yoga instructor, is a yoga instructor integral to what a yoga business does? The answer is yes. So in Dynamex, that court case it was based on, the example they gave was, well, when a retail store hires an outside plumber to repair a leak in their bathroom on its premises, that person, that plumber, is not integral to what a retail store does. <clears throat> the court also said, <clears throat> if, you, if you have this independent contractor doing work that is the same work as an employee, well, then that shows that they are doing something that is integral to what the business does, okay? C, independent business. Um, has this independent contractor worker taken steps to establish and promote an independent business? This does not mean that you have to go and run out and get become a C-Corp or an S-Corp or an LLC or anything like that. It can mean that. You can have that. You can also be a sole proprietor. But you have to be able to show that you are an established business. And so while you might be a sole proprietor, you, that means in the county or city you live in, you may need to get a business license. Um, other ways that you can establish this is, do you have a website? Do you have business cards? Are you advertising your services to the general public? Um, in the Dynamex case, they also said an indicator of being an independent business is, do you perform the services for multiple other businesses. So again, it, are they um, showing themselves to the public as being available and are they working for one particular place or are they able to work for multiple particular places? They want the independent contractor to be working for multiple, pla multiple places. So that in general is the ABC test. So what else did AB5 do? AB5 created exemptions. So I wanna be super clear about what is an exemption because I've heard it many times being misconstrued. An exemption is, all that means is that that particular analysis to determine if a worker is an independent contractor or an employee 
is exempt from using the new ABC test, that stricter test, and instead needs to satisfy certain factors that are in the statute. And if they are able to do that, then they use the old independent contractor test, which I'll go over, called the Borello test. And that's named after a court case. <clears throat> okay. It does not mean you are exempt from this analysis completely. It doesn't mean if you have an exemption that you're automatically an independent contractor. It simply means that you are exempt from using the ABC test. And so AB5 had certain exemptions that may have been applicable to the type of work that um, nonprofits and arts um, organizations did. So there was an exemption for a professional exemption for um, a fine artist, but that term was undefined. Um, it has since become defined. Um, photographers and photojournalists, but what the law said, AB5 said, was that it, that they, that a photographer could not submit uh, more than 35 of their photos to a particular hiring entity. It had to be less than 35. Similarly, for a cartoonist, um, less than 35 submissions to one particular entity in order to be uh, eligible for this exemption. And then lastly, grant writers, just because um, I know that nonprofit organizations use grant writers. Even before I was um, went to law school, I was actually a grant writer in a nonprofit for three years. Um, <clears throat> so imagine hire, instead of having someone internal, um, grant writing, you're hiring some sort of a consultant to do your grant writing. So these were exemptions that already existed in AB5. And they were under a specific type of exemption called a professional services exemption, which I'm going to talk about um, because it's applicable to what has happened more recently. Okay, so what is a professional services exemption in AB5? So what it is saying is, if you meet these six factors here, if the worker meets these six factors here, then they are, they fall under the exemption. And if they fall under the exemption, then they are able to do the analysis of whether they are an independent contractor or an employee under the old test, the Borello test, instead of the ABC test. So a way to think about this is really it's a two-part test. Do you first meet these six factors? If you do, then you go to the next step, which is let's do the analysis under the Borello test, which I'll talk about in a second. So for the professional services exemption, the six factors that you, that, that would need to be met in order to qualify is, does that worker have their own business location that's separate from the hiring entity? The law does allow it to be like a home office. Do they have a business license or any other type of required professional licenses or permits? Do they set or negotiate their own rate? Do they designate their own work hours um, outside of proje project completion dates and reasonable business hours? So what that is saying is, there are going to be some dates and, and hours that the hiring entity can set um, about when they want the project due or what their business hours are. But other than that, does the worker have the right to designate their own work hours? Um, number five, have other clients or make themselves available to other clients. So this is similar to what I was just talking about um, under the ABC test uh, being C. Do they have, do they work for just this one hiring entity? or do they have multiple other clients? And then the last one is really about control. Exercise independent judgment in performing their services. So let's imagine that you have a grant writer that you're trying to hire and they, have, they meet all of these six factors. Okay, great. That means that that grant writer may be, uh, it may be applicable for, or is applicable for the exemption so let's now see if they can meet the Borello test, the old test. So here's the old test, um, which is 
what the exempt, the same as the exemption test. Okay. There is, so this is different than ABC. So if you recall, when I was talking about ABC, I said that um, the hiring entity needs to prove A and B and C. Borello test is different in that it is a totality of the circumstance test, which means let's look at everything and let's balance it. But in the Borello test, they do indicate that there is one primary factor and that is control. Again, similar to um, A of the ABC test. So the primary factor is whether the business exercises and or retains the right to direct and control the manner and means in which the work is performed. And really it's asking the same questions that I was indicating before. It, who is deciding where the work is being done, when it's being done, um, how it's being done, is there, what level of supervision is there? Um, do, again, talking about control, does the hiring entity have the right to uh, terminate that relationship? So once you look at the primary factor, then you look at a bunch of different secondary factors, and there's a lot of them. And just to be clear, again, it's a balancing test because often what I've heard is someone will come to me and say, well, the worker meets one of these secondary factors, therefore they're an independent contractor. It doesn't work like that. You have to look at all of them and then you have to balance them. Which one, some are gonna lean more towards it being an independent contractor contractor classification, and some are gonna lean more to being an employee um, classification, and then you kind of have to balance it. So some of the secondary factors are, um, again, is the worker in a distinct occupation that's separate from the hiring entity? Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like B, right, from the ABC test. Um, similar to the next one, is the work regular or integral part of the hiring entity? Um, is the work done on the direction of the employer? What's the degree of skill? Uh, the, typically, if you have an independent contractor, they are not someone who's junior. They're someone who's specialized and have a higher degree of skill. Um, the question about supplying instrumentalities, tools, place of work. If they're an independent contractor. They should be supplying their own instrumentalities, tools, and place of work. The next one has become actually, I feel, more more of a focus in Borello, which is, is that worker invested in their business? Do they have a right to hire their own employees? Do they have an opportunity for profit or loss in their own business? So really looking to determine what level of investment um, financially and non-financially does the worker have in their own independent business? Um, Next, length of time for which the services are to be performed. Usually, if it's a discrete project, um, that leans more towards independent contractor. If it is for um, a longer period of time, then that could be more of an employee. Same with method of payment. If it's by the job, more independent contractor. If it's like an hourly wage, that's more like an employee. And then if there's an in, uh, independent contractor agreement in place. So while I keep calling this the old test, this is very applicable because if you are gonna, if a worker falls under one of the exemptions, including the music and arts ones that we're gonna talk about soon, this is the test that you're gonna be using, not the ABC test. Okay. All right, so AB5 came out last year and then became in effect in the beginning of this year. What was the impact? Um, to be honest, it made it more difficult to classify workers in, as independent contractors. And, and that's, that's the truth of it. Um, and as the person in the screen is showing, it caused a lot of headaches. It caused a lot of headaches for um, businesses, nonprofits, um, in all kinds of industries. And so what was the response? What did people do? Um, I mean, a variety of things have happened. Um, businesses were forced to reclassify their work uh, independent contractors into employees. Um, some businesses moved out of California because this law is about how you classify uh, those workers that are working in California. So some businesses moved out of California and hired uh, workers outside of California. 
Um, some businesses initiated lawsuits challenging AB5. We hear about this all the time. It was in the news um, yesterday and today because there's ongoing litigation, as you may know, by Uber and Lyft in regards to AB5. Um, <clears throat> And some uh, businesses and industries filed ballot initiatives to overturn parts of the law. So I just for really quickly want to um, mention Prop 22, which is a California ballot initiative in this upcoming election. And that is specifically to exempt app-based transportation and delivery companies from AB5. It has nothing to do with the arts or the uh, music sector. It is about Uber, DoorDash, Lyft, um, Postmates, some of these app-based delivery companies, okay? Um, and then the other thing that happened a lot is business and, uh, businesses and industries lobbied hard to seek their own exemptions to the ABC test. And that was successful. I mean, the music industry immediately started speaking up um, after even after Dynamex um, was passed in earlier in 2019 and definitely after AB5 was um, in regards to how AB5 was going to negatively affect their business or it was not a model that was gonna fit what they're doing. Um, and so while AB2257 passed, there were like 20 or 30 um, different bills that were up in the California legislature for different types of exemptions. Okay. All right, so let's talk about specifically the impact um, of AB5 on the music and arts sector. So who is it, who did it affect? So always the question is who's the hiring entity? Because with the ABC test under AB5, the burden is on the hiring entity. So situation, we have a young kid in his garage recording on GarageBand who invited his friends over to play instruments. Theoretically, that young kid is a hiring entity because he is asking these other friends of his to come over to do a recording. Um, people who organize song camps where songwriters come together and write songs. Who's the hiring entity? If you have these people, um, whether they're part of an organization or not, but are calling together other songwriters and let's do something together, that could be construed as a hiring entity. A dance organization who hires an expert level dancer to teach a weekend dance workshop. Again, pretty clear here, the dance organization would be the hiring entity. And the question is, am I, employing this expert level dancer for Saturday and Sunday for four hours each day. Community theater that hires someone to help them with the lighting for their shows, which run three weekends. Again, hiring entity, community theater. Do I have to bring this person on to help me with lighting um, as an employee? An arts education organization who hires someone to develop curriculum for their program. So imagine it being a discrete project. We need you to create curriculum for the fourth grade. Okay, this arts education organization bringing on someone to do this, let's say it's a project for two months. Again, do I need, do I need to bring this person on as an employee because I cannot meet the ABC test? I mean, primarily because of B, which is if you're an arts education organization bringing on an art teacher to create your curriculum, well, then that art teacher is integral to what that business is doing, okay? So because everyone's cameras are off, I have no sense of if everyone is um, nodding or frowning. So I'm wondering if we could just have a few cameras on so I can get a sense of um, how folks are doing back there. Okay, great, thank you. I just see black, <laughs> black with names. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, so here comes AB2257 to the rescue. And as I write, only partially. Um, so this, this law really tried to combine like those 20 or 30 different 
discrete bills that had been moving through the legislature, um, which were specific to professions or industries, and combined it together and provided for um, certain things. It, so it was signed into law by our governor on um, 9-4-2020, and instead of waiting till the first of the year, um, he, it's, it became effective immediately. So AB 2257 is effective as of today. Um, and what it did was it gave us some definitions. Um, for example, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, is that notion of a fine artist undefined in AB 5. Um, which was actually a nice thing because it could have been interpreted in very broad ways. But AB 2257 has now given us um, a definition for it. It clarified certain parts of the poorly written um, law. It created new exemptions um, and it created some revisions. And there has been an impact um, on the music, um, music sector related occupations, musicians and performing artists um, as we start going through the details of that, I, I will say that there are particular professions and industries that got exemptions um, in the music and arts sector, but not all of them, um, as you will see. And it's very specific um, in, in some ways. So there is this huge list <laughs> of professions that have received an exemption under 2257 um, that are music sector occupations. And so again, remember what I was saying in the beginning, what this means is that if you are, if you fall into one of these, if this is your job, then you are, and if someone wants to hire you to perform services, they're gonna use that old Borello test, the totality of the circumstance test, not ABC test. So let's look at this. What is this about? Music sector occupations. It applies to jobs related to creating, marketing, promoting, or distributing sound recordings or musical compositions. That's pretty specific. Um, it is, it, and, if they, and then they give some examples here. Uh, recording artists, vocalists, musicians, songwriters, managers of recording artists, record producers and directors, musical engineers, photographers working on an album cover, independent radio promoters, and then there's this catch-all at the end. Any other individual engaged to render any creative production, marketing, or independent music publicist service related prim primarily to creation, marketing, promotion, or distribution of sound recording or musical composition. That's just a lot of words um, to say that it's really about the, the marketing or the PR um, of sound recordings and musical compositions. So while if you fall into one of these categories, or if you want to bring on someone to provide services that fall into one of these professions, you can use the, um, the old Borello test to do your analysis on whether they're an independent contractor or an employee. The one thing that they said um, in the statute on that, if you see the, the first bullet point, recording artists, vocalists, and musicians engaged in the creation of sound recordings. I have two asterisks there. It's because if those if those artists, vocalists, musicians um, are not being paid royalties for the music that they're creating, then they must be paid minimum wage and overtime. So they would basically um, uh, classify them as employees for that purpose of they, that they need to be paid minimum wage and overtime. Okay. I don't know, maybe we could talk about this after, I don't know how helpful this exemption is for the type of work that you all are doing, um, but it's the big one. It's one of the big ones. All right, then there is an exemption for musicians. So again, Borello, not the ABC test, will apply to musicians or musical groups 
but for the purpose, and this is important, for a single engagement live performance event, inclusive of rehearsals. One performance really is what it's saying. So the statute gives us definitions, a musician, individual performing instrumental, electronic or vocal music in a live setting, musical group, solo artist, band or a group of musicians who perform under a distinct name. This next definition is what's important because it's actually is what narrows this exemption. Single engagement live performance event. So what that is, is that you have to be a musician or a musical group. A standalone musical performance in a single venue location or of performances in the same venue, no more than once a week, okay? And it specifically says in the law, this does not include any performances by a musician or musical group that are part of a tour or a series of live performances at various locations, okay? So really this is about the musician who is wanting to perform um, one concert, <laughs> essentially. And when that musician, so in the, when you're talking about the musician exemption, there could be a few different hiring entities where you're doing the analysis. It could be, so if you imagine a situation where you have, um, let's just say a lead singer, and they need to bring in the drummer and the guitar player, um, they could be construed as the hiring entity. So the question is, um, when, when that, when that, um, lead singer asks these other musicians to come be part of the band for this one concert, are, are those folks gonna need to be his or her employee or independent contractor? So that's one area that you may have to do the analysis. Another area where you may need to do the analysis is the um, entity that's hiring the musical group or musician uh, to come perform this, um, for their guests, let's say. Um, in that situation, they're the hiring entity. So then again, the question, it's a similar um, analysis that you may need to do. Okay. Um, hold on, I'm trying to, whoops. Okay, the other thing in the musician exemption is that it has some very specifics about where this exemption does not apply. Okay, um, the musical group is performing as a symphony orchestra or at a theme park or amusement park or a musician is performing in a musical theater production. And so let me just talk about that one really quickly. Um, there was a, a webinar last week with, um, with the California for the Arts organization and Lorena Gonzalez, who is the, um, California politician who wrote AB5 and AB2257 was on the call. And when asked about specifically musical theater or symphony, why, why, are, they, why are you saying this exemption does not apply to them? Um, the answer was that the nature of the work in these situations is, is such that there is going to be control by the hiring entity. And her perspective was, if we know there's control and there's no way they're even gonna meet the old test, Borello test, then why would we create an exemption for them? Because we know that the control is there and so we don't need to create an exemption for them. And specifically outlining here, these few areas where they believe there is going to be control, which is someone who is in, playing in a symphony someone who is like a musician or uh, imagine at Disneyland or a musician who is performing in a musical theater production. Uh, the musician exemption also does not apply if the musical group is an event headliner for a performance uh, taking place in a venue location with more than 1,500 attendees. So again, I think the idea here is that we're not going to allow for this exemption. They need to, part, 
those in the musical group need to be employees because if you are performing in a really big uh, venue, then it means that there is going to be a level of control, but also that it, it could be that there's enough money there to make them an employee and to, and to um, classify them as employees and give them the rights and benefits that an employee um, can receive, which is similar to the last, uh, the last bullet point here, which, in, which, does, which says the music, musician exemption does not apply. Musical group that is performing at a festival that sells more than 18,000 tickets per day. Again, this is gonna be a really big performance. Imagine um, any sort of festival, musical festival, um, and those who are performing there. Okay. All right. Whoops. Um, so these are some of the definitions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It just goes back to uh, what we were looking at. Ah, going in the wrong direction. Sorry. Um, sorry. I have to go back. Okay, so this is the slide we were on. The, the words I have underlined here are um, defined in the statute. So, okay. here are the definitions for that, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Okay, AB 2257. There's also an exemption for what they're calling performing, performing artists, okay? This is how they have defined it. An individual performing material, that is their original work and creative in character and the result of the individual's invention, imagination, or talent. A performing artist. And the statute gives some examples. And it does say, here are some examples. This is not all of them. This is not an exclusive list. These are examples. So this idea of a performing artist and who could fall under that can be broader than the few professions they've given here, which is someone in comedy, improv, stage magic, illusion, mime, spoken word, storytelling, or puppetry. So again, on that call last week, or that webinar last week with Lorena Gonzalez, she was talking about how it was the first time in her career that she had mimes and comedians lobbying her, um, and she was having meetings with them. And so, and it worked <laughs> because they have an exemption here. Um, with the performing artist exemption, uh, it does specify that um, they cannot be in a the theatrical uh, production or a musician or a musical group. So again, that is narrowing um, who can be a perform performance artist, really excluding those who are in theater, which is, again, going back to the explanation from Lorena Gonzalez, which she believes is inherently um, involves control by the hiring entity. Okay, so again, what this means is that if you are a comedian, and um, someone wants to hire you to perform, they would do the analysis of whether you were an employer or an independent contractor on, um, based on the old test. Okay, um, so again, it's a two, for the performing artist exemption, there is, before you go to Borello, the old test, you have to actually satisfy these factors to be eligible. <clears throat> Are you, uh, is a performing artist free in control? Free from control and direction. Um, does the performing artist retain the rights to their IP? Their intellectual property is what IP is. That was created in connection with the performance. Um, does the performance artist set their terms of work and has ability to set or negotiate their rates? And are they free to accept or reject each individual performance engagement without being penalized in any form? So again, first you meet, if you meet, if the performing artist meets this set of uh, factors, then they're eligible for this exemption. Then you go ahead and do the Borello test to see in fact, if they can be an independent contractor 
or are they an employee? <clears throat> okay, so if you recall when I was talking about AB5 and I was uh, t first talking about the professional artists, uh, sorry, the professional exemption, well, what AB2257 did is add many more professions. And one such profession that was already there in AB5 was the fine artist. And what AB2257 has done is has defined it. So a fine artist is an individual who creates work of art to be appreciated primarily or solely for their imaginative, aesthetic, or intellectual content, including drawings, paintings, sculptures, mosaics, works of calligraphy, works of graphic art, crafts, or mixed media. And the reason I say that this narrowed the potential <clears throat> in terms of um, there being a broader interpretation is when AB5 came out and fine artists was not defined, folks who were actors, folks who were musicians were saying, well, I consider myself a fine artist, whatever, in, in the way that I define it. And if there is no definition, then there could be more, um, there could be more uh, folks who could fall under this. But now under AB2257, they have defined it um, as this, something very much related to art and not others. So what, you, so imagine now if you are a fine artist, what to do is, oh, I will go back, hold on. Ah. I'm going in the wrong direction again. Okay, so um, it's similar to what I was talking about in the in the beginning um, in terms of the professional service exemption. There are certain factors that you have to meet. If you meet them, then you do the analysis under the Borello test. There is another professional services exemption that came out of AB 2257 that could be applicable to the music and arts industry, which is um, a master class teacher. This is defined as a specialized course for limited duration that is not regularly offered by the hiring entity and is taught by an expert in a recognized field of artistic endeavor who does not work for the hiring entity to teach on a regular basis. So this is a specialist, right? This is an expert. This is that when I was talking in the beginning of an example of maybe a, a, an expert level dancer that you want to bring in to um, teach a weekend course. This is a, a master class performer. This is a new exemption, which may be applicable here. And so again, for the master class teacher, as well as the fine artist, you go, you see if you're eligible first, I'm going to move this, by looking at these six factors, okay, I can say yes to these things. If I do, then I go ahead and I can use Borello for the analysis. And I will say some of these things are hard to meet for people. Um, even if you are a master level, whatever profession you're in, not everyone has a business license. Not everyone has a business location. Often in terms of negotiating rates that, or setting rates, that's coming from the hiring entity, not, not the um, person providing services. All right, another exemption that existed in AB5 and exists in AB2257, but has um, broadened a bit in a way that could be helpful. Um, business to business exemption. So this is a situation where you have um, a, an established business and another established business and performing, um, providing services uh, from one to another. Now, while this may seem well, well, goodness, this could this can this seems actually quite broad, and this can help everyone, <clears throat> if as long as I have a business. The reason that it was very narrow in scope under AB five was because of one of the factors um, that said the business service provider is providing services directly to the contracting business, rather than to the customers of the contracting business. So what that means is. That example I gave you of the plumber going into the retail establishment, that plumber has a business and that plumber goes into the retail establishment, which is its own business, does its thing and then is gone. That is 
two business, that's a business to business relationship, right? That plumber is not providing services directly, at least, to that retail establishment's class, uh, customers or clients. But imagine a situation if <clears throat> where you are um, you are an art school, and you bring and you have this teacher that you want to bring on to teach classes. Who is that teacher teaching classes to? The, the kids, right, or the students? So that would be the art school's students or clients. And so the business to business exemption under AB5 would not have worked. So what AB2257 has done is now allows for that in a, in a particular way. What it is saying is that <clears throat> for number two, if there is a service, if there is a, a business and they have their employees, if they specifically have employees, not independent contractors, they have employees who are going to provide services to this other entity's customers, then they can do that. So what the situation would be, if we look at that art teacher situation again, let's say that art teacher is coming from a different art school and she is an employee of that art school then she can be contracted by the other art school to teach their students. So this actually has helped um, expand this exemption. I know that might be super confusing. And so if there's questions about this, I'm happy to <clears throat> answer if I can. There's another exemption that may be applicable for your um, types of um, industry and businesses called the referral agency exemption which is where you have the individual service provider. So imagine that being the independent contractor, um, then there being a referral agency, and then the referral agency having some clients. And so usually when we were looking at, okay, wh 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 where are we talking about independent contractors versus employees? It would be between the relationship between those service providers and the referral agency. And so under this exemption, um, <clears throat> it is saying that there can be circumstances where they are, where there can be an independent contractor relationship between the service provider and the referral agency. All right, so what can you, what can an organization do? You are now faced with the fact that AB5 and now AB2257 is your is the law in California that we have to operate um, under? Maybe there's an exemption. <clears throat> you still have to do the analysis, and like I mentioned, the old test, the Borello test, is still pretty difficult to satisfy under the law. Um, I can give a lot of examples, not right now, but in in situations where um, in where there has been litigation or in matters that I've handled. Um, where there's been an audit by the EDD, where they have found that the relationship is one of an independent contractor and not an employee, even though so many of those um, factors in Borello were met. Um, so what can an organization do? They can convert their independent contractors to employees. Um, it does, oops, sorry. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to hire them on forever. You can hire folks as temporary employees. Um, but once you have an employee as an, and you are an employer, as you probably know, there, there are definitely rights and benefits that come with being an employee. Things like over, if they're non-exempt, like hourly, overtime, meal and rest breaks, um, benefits, paid sick leave is required in California workers' compensation, um, even if you hire someone for a temporary project and they're your employee, you got to get workers' compensation insurance for them. It's expensive. The estimate is about 30%, the cost is 30% more to have an employee than it is to have an independent contractor. You can convert some independent contractors to employees, so not everyone. Um, maybe there's a way that you can distinguish what folks do and it's like, okay, these are clearly employees. These ones, I think, really can be independent contractors. It will, it can often require a shifting in how you have structured that relationship with them. Might look different than what it looked like in the past. Giving up some level of control. 
Um, another solution can be hiring um, the independent contractors through a staffing agency so that the worker is actually going to be an employee of the staffing agency and then you get them through them. So there is an employment relationship for that worker who they're getting their workers comp from and their, <clears throat> um, their paid sick leave. It's through the staffing agency. This though can be an expensive solution. And then lastly is don't reclassify um, workers and risk the consequences of misclassification. A um, few words on misclassification in terms of consequences. Governmental audits. If you are in California, um, the EDD audits for misclassification, they go back three years in time and they look at all of your contractors from the past three years and they do their checklist to determine whether they are, if they think they are independent contractors or not, they always think that they're independent contractors. Um, and they, and you um, will be assessed back taxes and penalties. It can be really expensive if you've used independent contractors for the past three years. Um, on the federal side of it, there are similar audits for, through the IRS and the Department of Labor. Um, there's also California statutes about certain, um, about back in 2012, there was a law that was passed about misclassification. Penalties can be as much as five to $25,000. $5,000 for like a first offense, $25,000 if you have ongoing offenses. Public shaming, and the reason I write that is if you are found to have misclassified in this under this statute, you would have to like put a notice on your, whether it's your uh, physical space or on your website saying that I have been found to have misclassified. The other thing that's always the risk with misclassification is if the worker themselves sue. That can be an individual lawsuit, that can be a class action. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, and in such situations, they can say, I was misclassified, I should have been an employee. That means the entire time I was working with you, I didn't get my meal breaks, I didn't get my overtime. Um, and there, any sort of expenses, you should have been reimbursing me for that. That's what it could look like. And just with regular employment lawsuits, things like attorney's fees can attach, which can be ex obviously expensive. Um, under AB5, there were um, additional consequences for misclassification. There are now um, the potential for criminal charges if you misclassify. Um, also, AB5 gave uh, California Attorney General and certain city attorneys um, power to pursue injunctions against businesses that are suspected of misclassification. And then that's it. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. much. A lot that. of information. <laughs> yeah, a lot of info, great information. And um, <clears throat> I believe I saw a couple of great questions in the chat. So let, let's go ahead and take just a few minutes before we start our um, little net, reconnecting networking. Um, and uh, Petra, are, are, do you have those questions or? Yes, I do. Great. So Take it away. Um, I think there's an underlying question, which is these things seem super arbitrary. I'm pushing a bunch of these questions together. Is there any, do you see any over, like overarching rhyme and reason that could explain to the people on the call who are like, well, that doesn't make sense. Storytelling and puppetry are also theater performances, anything like that. Any, any, anything you can say that would help understand why this thing also like the once a week like there's a lot of stuff that seems super arbitrary I, I can't totally um explain it i mean what i can say is that for the exemptions the new exemptions in ab2257 um there was a lot of lobbying by a lot of different industries and sectors and i think the the music and the theater and the performing arts sector was definitely out there doing what they needed to do to get their story and their voice heard. But the, it, it seems like it's going to, it may slowly evolve. Like, okay, we have, here's our first cleanup bill. We're going to pick this, this, and this, and then we are going to certain industries. And then we're going to decide which ones, um, like in what situations that would work. I think that 
again, just listening to Lorena Gonzalez last week, I think she did keep coming back to um, a, a belief that certain, certain industries or certain jobs or sectors have inherent control in, in the way that they're structured. And so that's why, for example, there's like the, they're not including some of the musical theater things, for example, or a symphony situation. Um, I, <laughs> I mean, at the, at the heart of it, to be fair, at the heart of AB5 and even Dynamax, lab, you know, when the Supreme Court ruled, it is about protecting workers, right? And when you're an independent contractor, you don't have rights and, and benefits that an employee does. And I 100% know that there are so many people out there that want to have the independent contractor relationship and it works for them in so many ways. It works for the, the individual worker, it works for the hiring entity, but there's also situations where maybe they're being exploited and that is what they're trying to remedy here. I mean, again, as you know, AB5, so much of it has been about the 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 talk about it has been about the gig workers, right? And the Ubers and the Lyfts and the DoorDashes and so on. But it has had a trickle down effect on really all businesses um, and all sectors in California. I'm gonna pick just one more question because we don't have a lot of time, but I think this might affect a lot of people in the room, which is how this would impact volunteer roles within arts organizations particularly how volunteers might be able to receive a stipend and the limitations around that. Right, so um, none of this applies to non-employees, right? Um, so, and again, this was made clear in, by Lorena Gonzalez also in that seminar. Not as a nonprofit organization, you are unique in that you are able to have volunteers. And so when we are talking about AB, applicability of AB5 and AB2257, we are talking about situations where you are paying someone for their work. If you are providing a stipend, it's really going to depend on how you define that stipend, because is the stipend for the work performed is the stipend for reimbursement of expenses. Um, maybe you need to get creative in terms of, um, of, of how, of what the stipend is for. But I mean, a nonprofit organization that has volunteers that are not paid can continue to do that. Does that make Thank sense? You. It does. Um, okay. So I think we will be sending out a follow-up email with the recording and with Shivani's email. So if you guys have more questions, because I know we didn't get to all of them, um, it would be- I can be... stay on also for a few minutes if that's helpful. Okay, after the, we do our other stuff, that would be great. Um, so we're going to spend about 20 minutes now just saying hello to each other and we'd like to give some great Thrive updates. Um, and it's just been a long time since we've all been together. So thank you for all being here. I wanted to let you know that um, you guys probably are aware that there's an election coming up. Thrive is doing a lot of voter outreach and we even have some arts organizations that are partnering with us. Thank you very much, Dragon Theater, among others. Um, and if anybody's interested in getting um, a weekly email with some um, materials that you can use, but also some social media that you can just retweet or repost. Um, let me know. Just send me a note in the chat and we'll put you on the weekly email. It's just between now and November 3rd, but it'll give you an opportunity to know exactly what's going on and also to um, uh, help get out to vote and make sure everybody knows how to vote. Um, we also have some great other events coming up that you can see on our website. And what I'd love to do is just hear from everybody and say kind of what's going on, what's kind of top of mind for you. So the way we're gonna do this is just one person can start and then we'll kind of popcorn it. So we can um, jump around. 
Uh, somebody's asking in the chat if we can get a copy of the slides. We are not going to send out a copy of the slides. We will send out the recording. And if you have more questions, um, you can ask Shivani uh, directly. We'll send out her email. Yeah, if you email me directly, that, um, and I, my email is all over the place, then um, I can send a copy of the slides. Um, so anybody want to volunteer to start to share a little bit about how kind of what's your one thing? What's the kind of top of mind thing that's going on right now for you? And if nobody volunteers, I'm going to pick someone. Okay, Roberta, go ahead. Introduce yourself and your organization for those who don't know. Um, so I'm Roberta Wenzel Walter with Arts Unity Movement. Um, we have a, a COVID art show up on our website that, that our groups have done during the pandemic. Uh, we are, are socially, let's see, we are sponsoring, fiscally sponsoring Pagan Baby that is doing uh, Hearts with Wings. Uh, we she did a, a, a thing at San Quentin last week with all these 69 hearts with wings representing the people that have died from COVID at San Quentin. And she's going to bring them to the Women's March next Saturday. Um, we've just been, Colleen and her friend are, are doing a thing on the history of racism. Um, it's a bi-racial, bicultural group. Um, we don't know when it'll be able to be live, but they are teaching it anyway at a high school. Uh, they're co they're co collaborating on that to bring that up, and um, our BHRS is having weekly, um, well monthly. We have talks about about those sorts of things, and otherwise we're just doing our groups and trying to stay alive. Thank you for sharing. Pick someone else. Now you're on mute again. How about Kimberly? She there? Kimberly, are you there? I wonder if she signed off. That's okay. Can we, how about Alicia from Broadway by the Bay? Hi there, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, yes, we are essentially in a period of hibernation. Um, we can't produce any obviously live performances like the rest of us. So we have spent the last few months really leaning down all of our overhead and we're in the process of seeking um, a new venue partnership for when live events um, come back online. We're not uh, delving too deep into the online content. There's a number of groups that are doing that and we're choosing to kind of elevate their work versus uh, add more to that competition space. Um, we're recording a holiday album completely from home <laughs> just to kind of give ourselves something uh, creative to do in this season. But, you know, like everybody else, just trying to find ways to anticipate um, what will be the controlling factors for us. We've done a pretty robust patron survey um, and gotten a lot of feedback from that about patron behavior and what uh, their comp comfort level is when um, venues reopen and things like that. So we're taking this time to really uh, try to assess the information we have. We're also doing some pretty intensive um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work during this downtime, which um, we're really excited to do and kind of reforming the organization to reflect all of this new information. So, <laughs> you know, we, um, that's what we're doing. We kind of have our head down and we're really working on infrastructure at this time. That's great, thank you. Um, I think Cindy Abbott is, is this mysterious bee. Are you? No. Okay, anybody want to volunteer? I want to add that our dancers are working on collaborating with uh, Tracy Farron to do with the hearts with wings. So they're, they're starting to, they'll be doing that at some point soon. Great. Robin, Robin wants to share. I was just going to add, because uh, Alicia made me remember um, that the uh, San Mateo County, um, uh, we, we actually, 
before George Floyd and all of, of, of that tragedy um, uh, began at the very end of 2019, sort of January 2020, um, uh, the supervisors led by uh, the lead supervisor was Supervisor Warren Slocum, District 4, uh, wanted to uh, do uh, create an office of, it's called the Office of Equity and Social Justice. And so that was launched early January to, to work on that in, in uh, and they did a a uh, complete countywide survey in depth of where the community, various communities uh, um, are, what the needs are, it was really in depth. But of course, COVID threw a, a, mon a big monkey wrench into the work on completing that landscape. Uh, it is now, hallelujah, done um, as of the end of September. And Mr. Callagy, uh, Mike Callagy, County Manager, will be announcing like within the next just couple of weeks that the, the where that office will sit and it will be somewhere at 400 County Center, the main building, and the staff, um, and it will officially launch. And the Arts Commission, the reason I bring that up is because the Arts Commission has already, um, me, has, has already been in contact with the um, uh, people, the two staffers that did the landscape, uh, and um, we're sort of taking a lead as, the, the Arts Commission is being a lead commission, of county has 32 commissions, that is uh, delving in to working with this new office. And I hope to be sending out updates and information on how you all can possibly get in, uh, involved, become involved if you would like to. So that's, that's all I really have other than I'm well, I'm healthy and I take one day at a time, I'm surviving COVID. <laughs> and that's Robin, it. Thank you so much for that. Um... We're uh, Thrive is pushing out as much information we can at, at, as well about the um, county recovery, which is a separate initiative, but also an important initiative. Um, and you know, trying to advocate for the arts whenever there's an opportunity. Um, let's just go ahead and if anybody's still on the call who wants to ask questions of Shivani, we could just uh, be casual about it. Cindy can't figure out how to unmute her phone. Sorry, Cindy. Um, but Census Arts Center is doing all kinds of creative things to so take a look at their website. Um, does anybody have any direct questions for Shivani who's still on the line? So Petra, are you unable to, uh, to, are you able to unmute Cindy or no? She says she can't unmute. It's not letting oh, her unmute. I don't, I don't know if... Maybe Kirsten? Um, no, I, uh, I'm, I can ask her to unmute, but then she has to be able to do it on the phone, and I don't ah, know how to do that. Darn. So, um, does anybody have any questions for Shivani? Well, I missed part of it because I had another meeting that I had to jump off into and come back. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm feeling like this is all, I'm just have my blinders on. I have an assistant that helps me um, and she has her own business. She has a photography business and a translating business and once a week she ha she helps me with the girls in juvenile hall and, and it is a weekly thing and we pay her very well and I don't tell her what to do. I'm hoping, you know, I'm just hoping that's fine. I don't tell her what to do. I don't tell her what to do. She, she shows up and she does what she thinks she should do. And I love the way she does it. She's, she's wonderful. I'm happy to have her. So she's doing admin related stuff? No, she is co, she's my assistant. I, the two of us have a, 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 facilitate a group of girls who are incarcerated doing art. And we just basically hang out with them and talk to them. And there's usually a lesson and there's a, there's a project and we all do it. And we just sort of do, you know, hang out together for, for online. 
for an hour. Yeah, I mean, I think the first step would be to figure out if she falls under an exemption and based on what she does and then need to do the analysis. I mean, either it's going to be the ABC test or it's going to be um, the Borello, the old test, the Borello test, if she falls under an exemption. And, and if she doesn't meet either one of those tests, then you would need to consider making her an employee. What does that, do, does that mean? Does sure. that mean that we have to like have a whole bunch of red tape? So do you have other employees? I have one volunteer right now. We don't have any uh, the okay. dancers, you know, we pay them a, a, a modest amount when they perform, but we're not having any performances. So they're not. Okay. So if one becomes an employee, you would, there are certain benefits that they would get, even if they're a temporary employee. For any employee, you have to get workers' compensation insurance. We have, we have work women's comp. Okay. Do you have it for her? You can't, most likely not, because they won't cover an independent contractor. So, okay. So you would have to get workers' comp, even if it's for like the few hours that week. You, there are certain workers' comp companies that can provide you, um, with a reasonable cost <laughs> of benefits based on the number of hours one works. Um, so you would want to look for that. So she, she works like six hours or something. No, um, one, one hour a week. One so. hour a week. Yeah, definitely. So for that one and hour. Her, and week, she's at her house. Okay. Yeah, I know. Um, and then certain like paid sick leave is a California benefit. If you live in a particular city, they have their own paid sick leave benefits, um, but it's based on accrual. It's like one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours worked. It would take her a really long time to even get one hour. Um, she would be a non-exempt employee, an hourly employee. So you would have to have a proper payroll set up where you're taking out payroll taxes. Um, as an employer, as well as, um, you know, she, she pays into certain things as an, as an employee. Um, so that would be something you would need to figure out if she's working one hour, one hour, you, you don't need to worry about like overtime or meal breaks. Cause that kicks in after five hours of work. So there, I, I think your expenses would be related primarily to workers comp and the payroll benefits, but it would be well, pretty minimal. I mean, our goal, I mean, we, we've always been wanting to get enough money so we could have actual employees. I mean, we would like to do that, but we don't, we're just on a shoestring right now. We're barely surviving or barely, you know, we're going in the hole, actually. We just happen to have reserves. We're, so we're living in, we're not bringing in, yeah. we're about $1,000 a month that we're not it less than what we bring in. So this you know, this is not, yeah, so what we're, we're trying to do is, is find some way to get more money so we can have employees. Yeah, and I think this is, this, I mean, this is the issue for, for a lot of nonprofits, right? I think that when this was all passed pre-COVID, and so, well, not the amendment, not AB 2257, but Dynamex last year and even AB 5, when we weren't even able to conceive what w is about to happen to us and the impact on nonprofits and business and our economy in general. Like this is all so unchartered, right? What's happen happening in the last six months, seven months now. Um, and so it, it's, it was hard before pre-COVID to try and figure out how do we convert folks if we need to for, from a financial, from an administrative logistical standpoint and now it almost seems impossible <laughs> for for many businesses and, and organizations and so I, I can't tell you just keep doing what you're doing I think you just do the analysis maybe structure the relationship in a way where you it can support the independent contractor um, classification more so but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the law, right? Like, that's the thing. It's, it's our current law. And so you get, 
you need to figure out a way to either comply with it, comply with it one way or another. Well, she does have her own business. So maybe there's an exemption there. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking to look at that. Thanks. Okay, so thank you guys all for coming, especially to our special guest. Thank you for, for that really informative presentation. And um, it's, it's a shame that that's the way the law is because it is super complicated, but hopefully this helps everybody navigate it. And um, have you look, everybody will get a follow up email. And um, thank you guys all for coming. All right. Thank you, thank you, Robin, for your partnership. Yeah, thank you. That's, of course, my favorite partner, Thrive. <laughs> We love you too, Robin. We, we, I love you back. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>